program, but it seems like the microphone was not functioning properly, but I think we're good to go now. So let me know if we're good to go now. My kids are in here playing with the setup. I took a shower, kids come in here, everything's disorganized, but that's okay. Having our brain fuel, yeah, make sure you check out brainfuel.com. Use promo code pokercoaching for 15% off. Oh, I love brain fuel. A few of my employees have started drinking brain fuel. One of them used to drink eight glasses of soda per day. Now he drinks one brain fuel. To be fair, I used to drink eight cups of coffee a day. Now I drink one cup of coffee and one brain fuel. Turns out long lasting, high quality energy is very, very valuable. It doesn't make you like insane, right? There's a lot of value in not being insane. All right, we're good on YouTube. Are we, are we anywhere else right here? Let me know. Maybe we are, maybe we aren't, who knows? Looks like all YouTube comments so far. If you're here on Twitch, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, whatever, wherever else we stream this thing, let me know. All right, today, we're gonna be discussing how to play small pairs, primarily when you miss the flop, but we'll be going over some spots where you hit the flop as well. Louis Philippe, good morning, good morning. We have a poker coaching study group, by the way. Make sure you check that out in our Discord. Go to the study sessions tab and get in there. All right, first things first, we're gonna be discussing on the flop as the pre-flop raiser, okay? This means we raise, someone calls us heads up, then we see the flop, fine. In this scenario, we have the range advantage flow chart. This is part of the tournament masterclass at pokercoaching.com. You can get a big discount right now at pokercoaching.com slash spring. And, you know, I go, this is slide 53 of the post-flop section. So I go through a lot of instructions for how to make full use of this. But essentially on the flop, your betting frequency, as we see here, is going to be determined by first things first, are you in position or out of position? Because that impacts how much of a range advantage you typically have on various boards. For example, we see here, in position, this means we raise and typically big blind calls. It's a little bit different if the small blind calls, but if big blind calls with a very wide range and we raise from pretty much any position, we're going to have more good hands than they are, right? Because they're defending our big blind very wide. Therefore, on these big uncoordinated boards, we typically have big or uncoordinated boards, we typically have a pretty big range advantage and that's going to result in us betting very, very frequently, perhaps 80% of the time or more. We're going to show you that in just a second. As your range advantage decreases, you bet a little bit less often, right? Um, you go from betting basically everything, your premium hands, your draws, your marginal hands, and your junk, to mostly betting premium hands, draws, plus a few additional hands. And then whenever you have a weak range advantage or no range advantage, such as on the low card boards that connect very well with the big blind caller, that's the time you're going to want to be checking very, very frequently, okay? From out of position, you are basically never going to have a big range advantage because the people who call in position usually have a reasonable range, right? So if they have a reasonable range, their, uh, their range kind of lines up well with yours, which is going to result in you having to check from out of position a whole lot more often, okay? Next, once we decide that we're going to bet, we have to figure out how much we're going to bet. Do we have the range advantage? Nice and easy question. If we are in this area up here at the top of this region, the answer is yes. If we're down here, but we're still betting with just our premium hands and our draws, we end up over here. So essentially when you do not have a range advantage, more on this side, you are betting with a very polarized range, your best hands and your draws. And when you are betting very polarized, you typically get to bet using a larger bet size. Not always, but typically. Again, this chart is not going to encompass every single spot in poker you're going to play, but this really does cover like 90% of them, 95%. There are some corner cases, but this roughly works. Um, so if you're betting infrequently, you almost always bet large. If you are betting frequently, meaning we're up here, next you have to ask, do I have the nut advantage? If you do not have the nut advantage, such as on jack 6-6, six, six, because the big blind caller has a lot of sixes, you're going to want to be betting using a very small size. If you do have the nut advantage, such as on ace-king-queen, you're going to want to ask this question. How well does the opponent's range connect with the board? On ace-king-queen, whatever your opponent has, their range connectivity is going to be pretty good. So yes, they connect well with the board. 
If your opponent connects well with the board, meaning if they have like an ace of king or a queen, they're just not going to fold. And if they have eight, seven, they're always going to fold. Then you typically want to be betting on the big side, just to get full value from their good but non-premium hands. Um, on a board where they don't connect especially well, such as on king seven two, that's a spot where you have the range advantage and you have the nut advantage, but your opponent's range connectivity is very bad. And typically on those boards, you're going to want to be betting a little bit smaller. Okay? And as you are deeper, you want to bet a little bit bigger. As you're shorter, you want to bet a little bit smaller. Obviously, there are payout implications that may change things as well. Anyway, this is what we're working on here. Fine. The, the, what we're trying to figure out here today specifically is how do you play your small pairs? But quite often, the answer is how do you play your range? So let's take a look at this scenario. This is, again, straight from the Tournament Masterclass. We're 40 big blinds deep. We also discuss playing shallower stacks. Um, we have a cash game masterclass discussing deeper stacks. But let's discuss this. We raise under the gun plus one, and the big blind calls. Okay? Flop comes ace, jack, five. All right? This is a spot where we have the big range advantage, and we have the nut advantage. Why? Because, look, we have aces, jacks, ace, jack, ace, king, ace, queen, ace, five suited, pocket fives, right? We have all of the nuts in our range, and the big blind caller does not. Because we have the big range advantage, that's going to result in us betting very frequently, right? And this board, opponent has decent range connectivity, so this is a scenario where we're going to be wanting to bet big some portion of the time, small some portion of the time. And as you see here, on ace, jack, five, with our entire range, we're pretty much betting. We're betting 95% of the time, right? Using a mixed sizing. We're not going to discuss bet sizing here all that much today, but we are betting here very frequently, right? And if we go back to our chart, right? We have a very big range advantage. We want to be betting very frequently, right? 80% of the time or more, as we saw. GTO strategy here is 95% of the time, right? So if you're betting 95% of the time, you can pretty much for simplicity bet 100% of the time. And we see here that small pairs are just betting effectively as a bluff. We see literally every hand betting, right? Using this mixed sizing strategy. But you see like pocket threes, pocket fours, pocket sixes, all these hands are betting. So when you raise under the gun plus one with pocket sixes, big blind calls, flop comes ace, jack, five, you should be betting with your pocket sixes. Simple as that. Why? Because we have a big range advantage, we have a big nut advantage. We have big range advantage and nut advantage, you bet very, very frequently. Let's take a look at another spot. Um, we're somewhat ignoring this here. I'm just showing you the GTO strategy today, but this is the implementable strategy. We teach our students at pokercoaching.com how to develop their own implementable strategies. We have a lot of homework questions at pokercoaching.com that essentially ask you to develop this. Don't copy and cheat off the GTO strategy. Figure this out, right? And if you can figure out how to play your entire strategy in an implementable way, you're going to be way, way, way far ahead of basically everyone you play against. So anyway, now we're on the button against the big blind, okay? We raise button, big blind calls. We have a much wider range, but so does the big blind. Flop comes ace, jack, five. We still have the range advantage and nut advantage. As you see here, equity, 60%, 61%, which is very high, right? Whenever you have big range advantage, you want to be betting very frequently. Now, opponent's range connectivity is going to be a little bit worse, and our range advantage is not quite as big. Remember the previous example? Our range was much stronger. We had higher equity, right? That typically leads to us wanting to bet a little bit bigger as your equity decreases, but you're still betting frequently because you do have the range advantage. You're usually going to want to use a smaller size. Someone asked what sizes are these? As you see here, these are two-thirds pot and one-third pot, okay? Up here, two-thirds pot and one-third pot. It was mixed, right? So anyway, ace track five. We're betting again with everything. You see pocket threes, bets every time. Pocket twos, bets every time using a small bet size. And what a lot of people get hung up on is they want to ask, why am I betting? Am I betting for value or am I bluffing? Or am I betting for information or am I betting for protection? Why am I betting this hand? But that's not exactly how poker works. While it's nice to have general rules, like I want to bet for these specific reasons, when you have the range of nut advantage, that is why you're betting. You're betting because your range is very far ahead of your opponent's range. 61% is very high. Whenever you have 61% equity, you want to be betting very, very frequently. Now, you could say I'm betting this hand for protection or whatever you want to say, but you just see here you're betting basically everything. Um, you may note the hands that are checking make a lot of logical sense. Pocket 10s, 9s, and 8s. These are the hands that are checking most often in pocket kings. 
Because if you bet and get raised, it's pretty nasty, but you're not gonna get raised here all that often. And um, you're, you're in pretty decent shape. And also if you do get raised, it's fine. We have a very, very strong range to begin with, right? I wanna welcome everyone here today. If you're enjoying the show, do me a quick favor, click the like and subscribe buttons, click the notification bell, click all the buttons, that, that helps me. I wake up bright and early, 9 a.m. for you. Actually, I, woke up at, I wake up at 6 a.m. every day to deal with the kids. But I wake up bright and early for you. Click the like and subscribe button for me. I appreciate it. Anyway, though, what it amounts to is you're not betting for a very specific reason beyond it's the most profitable play. Now, of course, if your opponent plays some abnormal strategy, like let's say if you bet the flop, your opponent will raise you every single time. How does that change things? Well, you don't really want to bet with pocket threes and get raised every single time because you have no clue if your opponent has a good hand or a marginal hand. In that case, you probably want to start checking it back. Let's say if you bet your opponent will fold every time and let's say have an ace or a jack. Then you definitely want to bet because they're going to be drastically overfolding and they're going to give you really clear information, right? So as your opponent plays worse and worse in a way that you can predict, you can certainly adjust your strategy one way or the other. But as we see here, ace, jack, five, 40 big blinds deep, just bet every time. Now, Let's talk about the scenario where 40 big blinds deep, we're under the gun plus one, we raise, and now the button calls. Okay, so this is different than the previous two spots because now we are out of position, which is going to force us to check more often. Why? Because when we are out of position, you see we never have a big range advantage. Okay, so since we never have a big range advantage, we need to check sometimes. Hands that like to check primarily are the marginal made hands. So, which hands are marginal made hands on ace, jack, five? Well, to some extent, you're going to find the GTO strategy is very mixed in this scenario. But if you want to develop an implementable strategy, marginal made hands are going to be something like weak, weak ace, x down to like pocket sixes, right? These are hands that are pretty happy checking it down. If they check down, they probably win. If a lot of money goes in the pot, they probably don't. All right. Um, notice here, I don't actually raise fours, threes, and twos from under the gun. If you did raise fours, threes, and twos here, I bet those are going to be used as bluffs, funny enough, because those are weak to the point that if you bet and get called, slashed, raise, you're just in... I'm sorry, if you, if you check with the pocket fours, threes, twos, etc., and your opponent bets, you just have to fold, and if they check it down it's somewhat likely they beat you or they have good equity. So you're going to find that these marginal hands are ones that check a little bit more often. Like I would bet here that pocket kings from a GTO point of view does a pretty good amount of checking. Like ace four suited probably does a pretty good amount of checking because these are hands that if it does check down or one bet goes in, they're almost certainly good. But if a lot of money goes in, they're almost certainly not good, right? So always, always keep that in mind. Um, you'll find that probably a hand like pocket sixes is going to bet more than a hand like pocket kings because pocket sixes doesn't really mind you know, protection or whatnot, and it's just a weaker hand. It's going to be the worst hand by the river more often than pocket kings is. So let's take a look at GTO strategy here. Notice this implementable strategy I uh, lined up had us checking about half the time and betting about half the time. You look at these numbers over here. You see we're betting with a strong hand. We're not planning on folding 30%. We're betting with a draw, which are going to be gut shots, backdoor flush draws, etc. 19%, so 50% here. Checking. These hands in green looking to check call a bet for the most part. And checking these hands in gray, which you can't see, but these are going to be king nine suited, king eight suited, queen nine suited, without backdoor draws, right? Checking just our total garbage plan to check fold. All right, GTO strategy. Let's take a look. Same spot. Remember I said pocket sixes? Probably bets more than pocket kings. You can see kings is betting about half the time. Sixes is betting about 85% of the time. Sure, right? I said fours and threes probably bet a lot. Makes sense because they're weaker hands, right? Um, notice ace four, ace three are checking a lot. Ace five bets a lot because it's a premium hand, right? This is all kind of logical if you go through and try to figure this type of thing out. Um, so you're betting your best hands. As we see here, solvers betting like ace nine and better, just planning to get a lot of money in. Betting a lot of the gut shots, king, queen, king, 10, queen, 10. Betting these backdoor draws here. All makes a lot of sense. And that's roughly what the solver is doing. So here we see when you have a small pair and you miss, it depends on how small your pair is. Like pocket tens does a lot of checking. Pocket kings does a lot of checking. Whereas pocket sixes and pocket fours does a lot of betting. Why? Because they are weaker hands. And this is sort of a difficult thing to nail down when you are playing. Like where is the line, right? Because we see nines checks a lot. But eight starts to bet a pretty decent amount. And sevens bets a lot. Where's the line? If I was playing this in game, 
because like I didn't look at that when I just gave this whole spill about what I would probably be betting and checking. I figured the line would be right about pocket sixes. I figured sevens would check a pretty good amount of the time. And you see, I'd be, you know, a little bit off on that. And, you know, it's fine. It's fine to be a little bit off. You're not going to be perfect. And these scenarios change substantially based on what the button's range is. Now, notice here, we still actually have a good amount of equity, right? 60%, roughly same as in this scenario against the big blind. But we're going to realize it way, way worse because we are out of position. For example, when we have pocket tens and we check call a flop bet, and then they keep betting the turn in the river, we're going to fold the, the pocket tens out by the river. Whereas if we were in position, we get to check it back or, you know, bet because we're in position with a good good range of nut advantage. But if we do let it go check, check, and we face one bet we can call, and then if they check the river, we, we win a lot of the time, right? So you're going to realize your equity works out of position. That forces you to do a decent amount more of checking, okay? Entering to see jacks check so much. When you're out of position, it's very important. When you're out of position with a big, or with, with a, well, just in general, when you're out of position and you know you're going to do a decent amount of checking, okay? Notice here, solver actually checks a little bit less than I do, which, you know, it's fine. Um, this is a spot where when you're doing a decent amount of checking, you must protect your checking range. Otherwise, you're going to end up folding out way too often by the river. So you see aces and jacks do a pretty good amount of checking in this scenario about half the time. And that is, I mean, and to be fair, a lot of hands do a lot of checking. You know, a lot of hands mix it up. But... The nuts from out of position often does go for a check because you're out of position and you're supposed to be checking a lot. If your checking range is all marginal made hands, then you're a little bit exploitable because your opponent kind of will be able to very clearly figure out where you stand. It's always nice when you're out of position to mix in some checks with premium hands. And I discussed this in the tournament master class about how you always do want to check some portion of the time. All right, so look, that's just one scenario. How do you play small pairs on ace track five? You do a lot of betting because your range is really good, right? As the preflop raiser. Um, let's briefly go through a few other spots here. Let's talk about king, king, six, okay? What about a check raising range? Does it have pocket jacks? Uh, 40 big blinds deep, probably not. Probably not so much. Maybe we'll get there today, maybe not. All of these slides are in the Tournament Masterclass. Check it out, pokercoaching.com. You can get a big discount right now, pokercoaching.com slash spring. That ends soon. Why don't you have a marginal made checking range like Jack X? The Jack X does check. Look, Jack 10 does a lot of checking. King Jack does a lot of checking. Queen Jack does a lot of checking, right? These hands do do a lot of checking. Not sure I understand the question. If we had weaker Jacks, they'd do even more checking. If we had fives, they would do a lot of checking, but we don't. Um, all right, let's take a look at this spot. King, king, six, big range advantage, right? And big nut advantage. We're going to be wanting very, very frequently here. Under the gun, plus one versus big blind. Um, notice that we don't want to bet big, though, because now the opponent's range connectivity is very bad. They're going to have a whole lot of hands like ace high, and queen high, and stuff like that, right? Why don't we have marginal made hands when we're in our checking range when we are in position? Because we have such a big range advantage and nut advantage that we want to be betting very frequently. Remember, go back to the, the range advantage flow chart. In position, do we have a strong range advantage? 57-ish percent or more, give or take. When you have a strong range advantage and you're in position, you want to be betting very frequently, 80% of the time or more. In this scenario, ace, jack, x, we have a big range advantage, in which that results in us betting very, very frequently, basically 100%. We saw 95% according to the solver. Why are we not checking hands like king, jack on ace, jack, five? Because we have such a gigantic range advantage and the opponent is in such terrible shape. All right, king, king, six, betting everything. So you have like pocket fours, just bet everything. Like on this board, even pocket fours isn't even all that bad. What about button versus big blind on king, king, six? Same story. Notice we have a lot of king, x, right? Mark definitely uh, knows here that if they probably miss the flop, small bets with them in a lousy spot. Yeah, like give them jack 10 here. You think your opponents are floating with jack 10? Probably should be. And um, it's, a, it's a nasty spot to be in. So here's another scenario, betting very, very frequently. So I'm going to show you one corner case here. When we are under the gun against the button. Notice here we're also betting basically every time. One of the rare spots where you bet basically every time from out of position. Why? Because you have a whole lot of kings and they don't have so many. They have some, but not a ton. Notice all these suited king x you have. And also you have 
all the pairs, whereas they are missing aces, king, aces, kings, queens, jacks, right? So your opponent's missing aces, ace, king, some ace, queen, kings, queens, jacks, tens, nines. Like, all these hands are all very, very good on king, king, x. And your opponent's missing a lot of those from their range. So here, even though we kind of don't have a gigantic range advantage, we have a lot of really good nut hands, and our opponent doesn't. When you have a big nut advantage, you get to bet more often. Um, I'm going to skip through some of these. Yeah, let's, let's, let's go through this one. This is this will be a, a fun one. Under the gun plus one, we raise, big blind call, flop comes queen, ten, five, all spades. What do you do with sixes, with pocket sixes, six of diamonds, six of hearts? Should probably just bet it. Notice here again, big range advantage, 61% equity, right? When you have a big range advantage in position, you want to be betting very, very frequently. Okay? So as you see here, betting pretty much everything. When you're raising under the gun plus one against big blind on boards, we have a range advantage. You just bet very, very frequently. This is a board, uh, queen, 10, five, all spades that some people think they don't necessarily have the range advantage on, but you do. Why, you may ask? Take a look at your range, right? Even though your opponent has a lot of marginal-ish flushes, you have a ton of nut flushes and a ton of king high flushes, right? So given you have a ton of nut flushes, your opponent just doesn't get to raise you all that often. And if they do raise you very often, they're just torching their money because you have the nuts a lot. We see here, like ace three of hearts, best queen 10-5 every time. Something else a lot of people screw up on the monotone boards is they often bet big. They decide to bet very polarized, just with good draws and good made hands, which you know, makes some logical sense, but they're forgetting they just have a big nut advantage. We have a big nut advantage, you get to bet very frequently. And um, you also get to bet small. A lot of people, if they have a hand like pocket kings or pocket jacks, and they bet, they're like, oh, I want to bet big to try to make my opponent fold out all their spade draws. But no one's folding out a good spade draw anyway. And if they want to call you with the random 8-7 with the 8 of spades, that's fine because you have hands like king-queen in your range with the king of spades that just absolutely demolish them, right? So it's not about how you play your exact hand. It's about how you play your range. Omar mentions here that we could use different sizes on various boards. Sure. You say uh, GTO in this spot is probably closer to like 25-ish percent pot. Sure. This masterclass was not designed to go through and try to tell you exactly how to play every single spot from the perfect GTO point of view. This masterclass was designed to teach you implementable strategies. It's very important that you make sure you learn implementable strategies. For example, queen 10 5 three spades is different than ace king four three spades. And it's different than seven six three three spades. And you want to do your best to figure out how to play these scenarios. And if you are trying to say, all right, on ace king three, I check a decent amount. On seven six three, I check a decent amount. And when I am checking, I'm using a bigger bet size. It just gets all convoluted to some extent. You gotta realize, I'm not a supercomputer. I'm not a super genius here. I got good at poker by studying poker a lot, period. And I think a lot of you are in the same boat. Turns out there aren't a whole lot of poker savants out there in the world who can memorize a bazillion charts. Look, I've been through basically every giant poker course on the market. To be fair, the giant poker courses out there are 20 hours long or seven, six, six hours long. Ours is uh, substantially bigger, substantially more built out. But what a lot of them do is they say, here's what the solver does. Copy it. And... I can't copy the solver, and I'm pretty smart, and I've been studying poker for 15 years. So if I can't copy the solver perfectly, and I can't memorize a bazillion spots, why should I expect my students, who are you know often recreational players, who can only put in five or 10 hours a week into poker, how am I supposed to expect them to memorize, all right, on a queen 10, five, you're supposed to bet 23% pot, but on queen 10, six, you're supposed to bet 27% pot. You know what I mean? It's, just, it's not implementable. There's a whole lot of value being implementable. All right, here anyway, let's see. Let's take a look at button versus big blind. Now you see we actually do a decent amount of checking. Why? Take a second, think about it. Why? Because we have a whole lot more junk in our range, right? Look at all these just random garbage hands, like uh, jack eight offsuit, right? Jack eight offsuit, nine eight offsuit, king seven offsuit, king six offsuit. We just have a lot of garbage in our range. And even though we still have all the ace suited, and we have a lot of suited hands. A lot of these suited hands are still very bad, right? Like 9-6, um, right? 9-6 no flush is pretty bad. You still see we're betting it half the time. <laughs> so that means we're betting all our flushes. But we're also betting uh, some portion of the time we have nothing. The 9-6 of hearts, right? 
But you see, we have way more junky hands here. And also you gotta realize, when we're under the gun, like even a hand like Pocket Jacks is probably the best hand, and a hand like Queen Jack is probably the best hand. Whereas here, you just have a lot of garbage. So let's take a look at how to play the small pairs in this spot. We see now that we are still betting a lot of the best made hands, right? We're betting aces, kings, a lot of our good queens. You're gonna see that's a pretty common pattern. Um, you see two pairs are mostly betting. And then you see a lot of random hands with spades. I know you can't really tell from this chart here, but you see like a lot of these hands here that are betting the ace x. A lot of these have the ace of spades. A lot of these kings that are betting have the king of spades, right? Queens are all to top pair. A lot of these jacks that are betting have jack of spades. So these are all effectively draws, and you're checking a lot of the junk. Since you are checking a lot of the junk, though, you also have to check with some very premium hands. Very premium hands that are checking here, like notice King Queen checking sometimes, right? Notice um, some of these these suited aces are actually checking back with a nut flush, which is kind of neat. Um, we have um, marginal pairs, right? We see nines, eight, sevens doing a ton of checking here because if it checks down, they probably win, right? And that is um, very very valuable. Let's see. So Omar mentions that you can't just develop really simple strategies, like just bet every time. And yeah, there are definitely really simple strategies you can do like bet every time. Like right here, you try to develop the implementable strategy. Um, notice my implementable strategy here is uh, not necessarily the easiest thing in the world, but once you understand how to do this, it makes logical sense. And you see it actually lines up pretty nicely with the solver. A solver, uh, what is solver? So we're, we are checking 45%, solver checks 41%, you know, pretty close. And um, this is going to be a substantially better strategy than just bet small every time. Now, obviously, if your opponents fold too often, which a lot of people do, you can just get away with betting every time. It's really, really nice when you're playing against weak, tight, passive, straightforward poker players who make your life really easy by just folding every time, right? Um, we, we discussed this in one of my newest book, Excelling at Tough No Limit Holding Games, about how if your opponents fold too often, just bet every time. I wrote about this in my first poker book. 10 years ago or whenever it was, about how it's just continuation bet small pretty much every time and you're gonna run your opponents over and you're gonna crush them, right? I'm not discussing how to play against really, really bad, weak, straightforward players. That's not all that hard to do. I wrote two very short eBooks. They also mention it. <laughs> all you gotta do to beat really weak type passive players is bet very frequently. But yes, anytime you play a strategy that is different than GTO, like this one right here, which is actually pretty close to GTO, but a little bit off, you are gonna lose some EV as you play farther and farther and farther away from the GTO strategy, you're gonna lose more and more and more EV. The question is, does the strategy you use lose a little bit, a medium amount, or a lot? For example, potting it here every time on the flop is gonna lose more EV than betting 25% pot on the flop, right? Makes a lot of sense, because you see here, solver doesn't actually do a whole lot of big betting, and it doesn't actually do a whole lot of betting to begin with, right? So that strategy is gonna be worse than one that uses a smaller size. All right, um, let's take a look at this spot, under the gun plus one against button. Now we gotta do a lot of checking again. Why? Because we are out of position. Also here, the opponent's range contains a whole lot of suited aces. So even though we have all the suited aces, so do they. And because of that, we have to do a lot of checking. Our betting range is gonna be much more polarized here. I'm still checking with some nuts, right? Remember, you always wanna check some nuts out of position. Like here, you see ace nine suited is betting, I don't know, 10% of the time or something like that. Um, so that means it's presumably checking with the nut flush a decent chunk of the time. So you see all these suited ace x doing some checking. Um, the weaker flush is often bet, right? Like 10 9 suited, 9 8. Actually, these aren't suited. Jack 9 suited, there you go. 7 6 suited actually does some checking too. So maybe that's not such a great heuristic. But here, small pairs. What are small pairs doing? Mostly checking. And a hand like pocket 8s is fine. Pocket 8s, check call. If you have the spade, if you don't have the spade, it's pretty nasty, especially if you face a bigger bet. Um, notice most of these aces are betting with the gut shot, right? So check out all of that. Again, we have implementable strategy here. GTO is checking 60. We are checking, uh, what, 50-ish, so a little bit less than GTO here. But, you know, nice implementable strategy. Best Bet your best hands. Um, notice we have pocket aces checking sometimes. Um, these here are listed as junk, but the spades are clearly not listed. Those are played differently. Those are slotted into either marginal made or premium. So anyway, that's how we're playing that spot. Jack 6-2. What about Jack 6-2? You should already know. 
We raise under the gun plus one, big blind calls. Jack six two are betting every time, right? That's obvious. Big equity advantage. Um, on the button, we have to do a little bit more checking, right? Again, the question today was, how do you play small pairs when you miss the flop? Jack six two with pocket five, so you just bet every time, right? Um, Jack six two against uh, button rig against big blind, you have to be a little bit more cautious with the small pairs because they actually do have a decent amount of showdown value. Essentially, as your small pair has a realistic amount of showdown value, okay? Meaning, if it does check down, or if you face one bet, you probably still win, you should be way more inclined to check it. As you lose showdown value, meaning if it checks down, you probably don't win, or if you face a bet you can't call, you should often be more inclined to bet with it. So you see on jack 6-2, pretty obvious you can just check this down and win a lot of the time. And therefore, you should be more inclined to check this hand than on a more coordinated board, in which case it becomes kind of like a bluff. Nice thing about these small pairs, when you use them as a bluff and you spike the set, nobody sees it coming. All right, let's talk about um, under the gun against button. Again, we're doing a decent amount of checking because we're out of position, right? That said, small pairs do still... Um, the, the, it's interesting here, right? Like sevens and eights and nines and tens still bet a decent amount, but the smaller pairs are more inclined to check. I actually would not be shocked if um, this is a spot where you should check raise the small pairs. We're not going to discuss that today, but check raising strategy is pretty neat, and I bet we're supposed to get after it. Is the spin and go course fully live? Yeah, spin and go course is fully there. Loads and loads of GTO charts um, for three-handed poker, right? Three-handed poker and heads-up poker. A lot of people screw up playing um, heads-up, shallow stacked. Now, I'm not going to show it to you. If you're a poker coaching member, go check it out. Uh, go to pokercoaching.com slash spring to get a big discount and get into the courses tab. Click on spin and go. It'll come right up. You can download all the GTO charts and um, they're advanced. I learned a lot in the process of working with Ryan O'Donnell, absolute crusher in the high stakes spin and goes making that course. And um, it's it's enlightening to so check that out. It's a big course too. Lots of, that, that's an advanced game. And, and Ryan's one of the uh, super geniuses there who studies a ton and absolutely crushes because of it. Let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. Do we want to talk about Jack 6-6 six, six, under the gun against Big Blind? So remember how we discussed when you have the big range advantage, you want to be betting frequently? It's not true when you completely lack the nut advantage. When you completely lack the nut advantage, such as on Jack 6-6, six, six, you have to be way more inclined to check. Because if you bet and get raised, it's miserable. Where is the heads up content? I mean, go to pokercoaching.com. Click on courses. Uh, you all can't see this. This is not going to be great. Let's see. Click on spin and go right here. Yeah. Click on spin and go. Scroll down. As you see, uh, let me see if I can pull this over here. Come on, computer. I'm trying to get this to undock. There we go. Um, here you can download all of the GTO charts. Go right down here. Here are the heads up pre-flop section of spinning goes, right? And uh, we discuss how to play all of this. Also, there's a whole heads up section, okay? On how to play shallow stacked spinning goes. As you see, here's all the charts. For example, let's see, uh, heads up small blind strategy. 25 big blinds deep. Woo, look at that mess. Fun stuff, right? 12 big blinds deep, as you see. We're not playing shove or fold, that's for sure. Eight big blinds deep. We're not playing shove or fold, that's for sure. Anyway, that's all there, pokercoaching.com. Where did my charts go? There we go. All right, all right, all right, all right. Let's see. Let's move on to some different spots. All right, now let's discuss when you do not have the range advantage, okay? When you do not have the range advantage, we're going to be down here on this section, which means we have to do a whole lot more checking. Okay, so let's discuss nine, seven, five. Okay, nine, seven, five. This is a board where we want to be doing a lot of checking. We raise under the gun plus one, big blind calls, 
This is a board really good for the player in the big blind. So we know we got to do a lot of checking. We're going to be betting very polarized here. Mostly just our best made hands and our draws. Notice before in all the other spots, we were looking at about 60% equity or more. Now we're down to 52, which is basically a flip. So now this is a spot where if we take a look at the betting hands, it's mostly like a good nine and better, right? Good nines and better are betting. One thing you'll also notice is uh, the pairs with straight draws, like gut shots often bet very frequently, right? Um, and then we're betting with some draws. Draws are gonna be a hand with an eight or a six. So uh, ace eight, king eight, a six, do a lot of betting. And then everything else checks, right? So we see a lot of the ace high, et cetera, et cetera. All these hands are doing a lot of checking. Notice pocket eights and pocket sixes do a lot of checking. Notice pocket fours and threes do a lot of checking, right? That's because we are betting very, very, very infrequently and we have enough logical draws to balance out our range. Um, notice some bluffs that are betting up here, just like random overcards that can't win at the showdown. You're gonna find that usually hands that cannot win at the showdown are better to bet than hands that can win at the showdown. If you have a small pair, ask Alistair, and you think it's good to show down reasonably often against a player that folds too often, should you then consider betting instead? Yeah, look, if your opponent folds too often, you're pretty much always gonna be best off just betting. If you bet and your opponent folds, that's great because you're denying all their equity, right? Like right here, if you knew you could bet and make your opponent fold out two overcards or a six or an eight, it's fine because then they don't get to realize their equity, meaning they're not, they don't get the chance to get there on you. And also they don't get the chance to try to bluff you, right? So this is a spot where you wanna be checking a ton. Same scenario, uh, button versus big blind, also checking a ton, same logical reasoning, right? We're betting mostly our best hands. As you see, like nine, six bets here a lot, right? Pair plus gut shot. Seven, six, pair plus gut shot, does a decent amount of betting. Um, as the pair gets weaker, it does more checking though. Like we see six, five doing a lot of checking, eight, five doing a lot of checking. But you notice here, like a lot of the sixes bet, a lot of the eights bet, right? Because they're, they're, they're draws. Um, as you see though, small pairs do a lot of checking on this board because we're betting so infrequently, right? Is it better to start playing $10 no limit instead of $2 no limit because of the gigantic rake in the small stakes games? Um, it depends on your side, of course. I would definitely recommend playing a game that does not rake you so gigantic. You wanna make sure every game you're playing is beatable. If you have questions about bankroll management, ER nurse and gamer, check out pokercoaching.com slash bankroll. I have a giant article on bankroll management there that will address your question. All right. Let's discuss under the gun against button, right? So here we raise under the gun button calls. We got to do a lot of checking, but now, but now, very importantly, even though it's like 50-50 range and nut advantage, uh, we still get to bet with some of our small pairs here. Why? Because we don't actually have a ton of logical draws. And now if we check it down with the fours or the threes and the opponent bets, it's pretty bad, right? When we're in position and it goes check, check, we can then call one bet and go from there. But when you check the flop of the hand like threes or fours and the opponent bets, it's not really all that great of a spot, right? Um, so we're gonna typically bet a little bit more often in this scenario with these hands just because they now have worse showdown value, right? Because whenever these hands have worse showdown value, you should be more inclined to bet them. As Remember, as the small pairs lack showdown value, you should typically bet them a little bit more often. As they have more showdown value, because usually you're in position, you should be a little bit less inclined to bet them in spots where you have a big range and nut disadvantage. Okay? Let's talk about 743. As you see, this tournament masterclass goes through all sorts of spots. And, um, you know, again, we go through the implementable strategy, how to play all these spots. But we're going to talk about just the GTO strategy today. Under the gun, plus one against big blind. Notice we have a little bit more equity, so we get to bet a little bit more often, right? And as we bet a little bit more often, we get to bet with more of our, um, more of our range in general, right? This board's a little bit um, tough to talk about because we, you see we don't actually have twos in our range, right? If we had twos in our range, I have to presume we would check it. Although maybe it's a bet still. This is a spot where we probably just want to be betting a decent amount of the time anyway. Even though, the opponent's range does have some nuts in it. Notice we just have all the big over pairs and we have the sets, right? So our range is still pretty strong here, which is shown by this 56% equity. <sighs> so anyway, as you see here, we don't really have small pairs. So we can probably just ignore this spot. 
in the tournament master class, we go through common categorizing of hand mistakes, right? We're not gonna go through this today, but make sure you check that out if you are new to categorizing your range. We go through various mistakes people can make categorizing the range that will make them play poorly GTO. All right, now let's discuss as the preflop caller when check to in position. This is what we want. As the preflop caller in position when check to. Yeah, okay. Under the gun raises, we call button. Okay? Under the gun raises, we call on the button and they check. Well, you should know this spot basically never happens to begin with. Because from a GTO point of view, they should bet this about 100% of the time where under the gun raises, we call button. Because they should continuation bet a ton. If they do check though, what are we betting with? Well, very, very polarized, right? And funny enough, in this scenario, you should expect to get check raised some portion of the time. So if you can get check raised some portion of the time, you wanna bet with your best made hands that are not folding, ace, queen, ace, jack, pocket jacks, pocket fives, ace, five. And then you wanna bet with some hands that are happy betting and then folding. Uh, you don't really wanna bet fold a hand like king 10 or king queen so much because it has decent equity. And if it does check down, you win every once in a while, but you don't really mind about check folding a hand like pocket fours, threes, and twos. So if you bet pocket threes and uh, you get check raised, you have an easy fold, right? So you see that these hands are ones that are used as bluffs, kind of unintuitive bluffs, something that um, is a little bit of a corner case, but you're gonna find that in position, you actually do start using these small pairs as bluffs a little bit more often than when you are the preflop raiser. Uh, so we'll not go through too many of these spots because these are not so common. I want to make sure we're discussing implementable spots here. Um, actually, I'm sorry. I take this back. I take this back. I was wrong about this. I was, I was confused about the spot we were talking about. They should check you a decent amount of the time. We can go back up here and find the spot. Um, jack, ace, jack, five, ace, jack, five. It's hard to keep all this stuff straight, even for me. Um, ace, jack, five. Here we go. Ace, jack, five. They do check a decent amount, 27%. See, you always got to make sure you're using your brain. Drink your brain fuel. I know it's early. Top set. Catching me live for the first time in a while. Welcome, welcome. If you all enjoy the show, do me a quick favor and click the like and subscribe button. Thank you for being here. I appreciate it. So, caught my mistake. It's always important to catch your mistakes. 28% um, of the time they check. But when they do check, notice they have aces sometimes, top pairs sometimes, kings, queens, jacks, tens, right? They have some pretty good hands when they do check which is why we don't get to bet very often in this scenario. As the opponent's range is strong and well-protected, you in turn don't get to bet quite as often. Now, that's not what I'm looking for. Um, whenever you do bet in spots like this where the opponent's range is well-protected, you wanna make sure you're very polarized because you are gonna be betting into a very premium range some portion of the time, right? Which makes sense, okay? What about on King, King, Six? This is a spot where the opponent should be betting very frequently. Remember, it is one of these spots. It's the corner case. Um, this is a scenario where range heavily depends on the opponent's strategy, of course. But you do see we actually have a lot of a pretty good amount of kings, so we do get to bet in this spot. What about under, a button versus under the gun on queen 10 5 all spades? When they check now, you have to be pretty careful again. You see, you're really just doing a lot of very polarized betting when you are in position, right? And that's typically what you should be doing. Against strong ranges, strong, well-protected ranges, you should be betting pretty infrequently because they're going to have some nuts and they're going to check raise you, right? So when you're betting infrequently, you're pretty much always going to want to be betting very polarized. Now, what if your opponent is especially weak and tight and straightforward and bad? What if you know on the flop, every time they check on this queen 10 5 all spades board, they have a 10 or worse. If you know they have a very marginal range or very weak range, you should be betting a ton, right? If your opponent's range is all weak, you should be betting almost everything. So do not forget to account for the fact that your opponents are probably not playing a good, strong, robust GTO strategy that results in them check raising you a decent chunk of the time from out of position. Most people don't check raise a decent amount of time from out of position. Um, it's, I mean, if, if you play a wide spread of tournaments, like often I'm playing between $100 buying games and uh, $2,500 buying games on random Sundays, you'll see that the best players in the world do a pretty good amount of check raising. The players in the $100 games do almost no check raising. And that results in you having to use different strategies, right? Bruce says, you love the content. Well, you're very welcome. Congrats on being here and turning from a fish to a shark. You got to beat a shark. <laughs> All right, let's take a look at Jack 6-2. 
Again, pretty polarized betting. No, we have a lot of notice we have a lot of jacks here, right? Whenever you have a good amount of jacks, you get to do a little more betting. Also, here the opponent's gonna be checking a lot of ace highs. So we even get to bet hands like sixes and we get to bet the middle pairs. Notice the small pairs still check though, because we're in position and we can reasonably check it down in this spot, right? In position, you get to do it really depends, right? Like, so notice here on Jack 6 2, pocket fives has a decent amount of showdown value, right? Whereas if we go back up here on ace jack five, pocket twos and threes and fours has way less showdown value, right? Why? Because whatever the opponent's checking on ace jack five probably has some sort of gut shot or it's a middle pair like pocket sixes, right? These are all hands that if you bet and they fold, it's fantastic, right? Whereas on jack six two, where'd it go? On jack six two, if you bet, yeah, if they fold out king 10 or 10 9, it's fine, but it's not nearly as big of a success, right? And if they do check call from out of position, it, it's okay, right? It's okay. So as you have more showdown value, you should be more inclined to check. Uh, 9 7 5, as we see here, small pairs don't need to bet because we have a lot of obvious bluffs, all the eights. We also have a pretty strong polarized range here. And on 7 4 3, Notice we don't have any small pairs, they don't exist. All right, let's go through as the preflop caller out of position really, really, really quick. Because we're running out of time. All right, we're in the big blind now against under the gun, okay? Big blind against under the gun against a 67% pot bet, which is the recommended size. You see here you fold hands as strong as pocket tens. A big mistake a lot of people make when they're out of position is they stick around too often. Notice here, our equity is in the dumpster, 30%, essentially none. When your equity is in the dumpster, because your opponent's range is so incredibly premium, you have to fold a lot. Notice here, we're folding 68% of the time. We are drastically overfolding compared to minimum defense frequency, right? Oops. So this is a spot where we have to drastically overfold. When we do bet the small pairs on the flop, are we triple barreling them sometimes? Yeah, we are. We absolutely are, especially when our range is otherwise very polarized, right? Like if our betting range is top pair, great kicker, and better, plus some junk, and the junk is small pairs, you should be tripling those some portion of the time, for sure. Um, what about... Let's see what here. Oh, we'll just quickly go through these spots. What about uh, big blind versus button? They have a much wider range. Notice we don't actually have the small pairs because we would have three bet them. So these are not in our range. 40 big blinds deep. A lot of these small and medium pairs are just ripped, it all, ripped all in. Make sure you check out our charts at pokercoaching.com. Let's see. This is in position again against a bet. Okay, so here under the gun plus one raises, we call button. Flop comes ace, jack five, they bet flop. You see now even hands again, like tens, nines, eights, seven, sixes, fours, threes, twos, opt to fold the majority of the time. Kind of cool to see that some of these very, very low equity hands are used as bluffs every once in a while. In reality, from an implementable point of view, just like never bluff, it's fine. What about on king, king, six? Big blind versus under the gun. You see now we're not folding any pair, right? Check call the majority of them. Check raise your good kings. Check call some kings, that way your um, calling range is very um, very manageable, very very reasonable, right? Kind of cool to see twos bluff here. I probably don't bluff twos here nearly often enough. I'll tell you what I do here. I, I mean, I'll show you what I do here. Uh, my bluffs in this scenario mostly come from the queen X, right? Ace X has good showdown value. The queen X has some, but not a ton, but it has a lot of backdoor draws. So we see in this scenario, um, these hands are the ones that I personally opt to use as bluffs. I think it's a little bit more logical a little bit more implementable, whereas the solver does use some of those hands. Not all of them, though. It opts to check call some portion of the time, like jack-10, right? I typically just check raise the jack-10 and the 10-9 and stuff like that, but solver does call sometimes. Um, so again, do you want to be implementable, logical, or do you want to try to copy the solver? You get to pick. We're running out of time here. We're not going to keep going through this, but know that we have all sorts of spots that we go through, right? Go through all of these scenarios in the Tournament Masterclass. Check it out at PokerCoaching.com slash spring right now to get a big, 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 big discount on PokerCoaching.com. Someone asked, when do we start using a shove or fold strategy? Well, luckily, you don't have to ask me this. Go to PokerCoaching.com. 
let's see, click on the Tools tab, go down here to GTO MTT Preflop Charts, and then we have this. Hmm, can I make this smaller? Let's see if this will work. Take a look at 40 big blinds. Position, big blind, action, versus a raise from the button. Button raises. Remember how I said? Let's go back right over here. Uh, where was that chart? Where was that chart? Here we have it. Remember right here how I said we don't have any pairs in our range? 40 big blinds, big blind versus a button raise. Notice we have no pairs. Where'd they go? They were played differently before the flop. 40 big blinds deep, 4-0 against a min raise from the button. This is the GTO strategy. Okay, take a look. So it's a min raise small with all the best hands. Min raise small, or sorry, re raise small with all the best hands. Re raise small with a smattering of bluffs. And then go all in with some hands. Ace queen, ace jack, king queen, offsuits. Nines, eights, seven, six, five, fours, threes, twos, and a few few bluff hands. Ace two offsuit, king seven suited, king seven offsuit. Right? So 40 big blinds deep. The GTO strategy is to rip it in. And again, we have all sorts of charts here. I mean, and it's very easy to just go through and change this. You can change this to 30 big blinds. It'll pop up the adjusted strategy, right? You'll notice, obviously, more all ends as you're playing 30 big blinds deep. Makes a lot of logical sense, right? Oh, hello. You want to come say hi? Come here. Look, say hello to everybody. Can you say hello? Let me see if I can find the webcam. There's the webcam. Say hi. Hi. What's your name? Thomas. This is Mr. Thomas. Are you having a good day? Your hair was so made up early today. Funny, James, James had a picture day today and his hair was all messed up and Thomas's hair looked perfect when he rolled out of bed. Now his hair's all messed up. Can you say good luck in your games? Good Say bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right, you gotta go. See you. See you. See you. All right, I gotta go. Check out PokerCoaching.com. I tried to give you all the tools you need. They're all there available for you. Check it out, pokercoaching.com slash spring. And again, you, you can get these uh, charts on your phone too. So make sure you reference them, right? I mean, you never have to ask the question of should you do something before the flop because it's all right here. It's all right here available for the Poker Coaching Premium members. I try to answer all of your questions so you don't have to guess. There's a lot of value in just knowing the right answer, and I've done my best to provide you the right answers. Now, of course, if your opponents are not playing the GTO strategy or they're doing something really wrong, use a different strategy. For example, if you know the button's really, really tight and they raise you 30 big blinds deep, don't rip it in with so many bluffs. Common sense, right? You got to use a little bit of common sense to succeed at poker. But beyond that, <laughs> all the answers are here. It's just a matter of of you sitting down and doing a little bit of work. I've done my best to consolidate the work so that you make good use of your time. Turns out your time is your most valuable asset. Please do not squander it. Thank you for being here today. Good luck in your games. Have a great, great day. If you like this, click like, click subscribe. Check out pokercoaching.com spring. Thank you for being here. I appreciate all of you. Have a great week.